debt deflation and liquidationism. Uh, yeah, I'm learning to uh, how to work with this thing. So, uh, first, what, what, what is debt deflation and what is liquidationism? Well, we'll liquidationists is a person who favors liquidation of the investment caused by market adaptation to passive government policy. <clears throat> so let me be clear about what passive government policy means. Well, it means any policy that is passive, meaning that it doesn't matter what are the conditions, what the conditions are, because conditions can be different, right? You can have different institutional setups. Therefore, passive uh, policy of the government can be different under different arrangements. In any case, very often, when you see a crisis happening, you could have government non-reacting, right? Non-reacting meaning that letting the things go their way according to the existing institutional circumstances. Now, what the circumstances are might be very, very crucial. So you could have very differing uh, institutional arrangements, different legal frameworks, uh, that will cause completely different results. Nevertheless, the passive aspect will mean that the government is not doing much, right? meaning that it's letting the river flow its way according to the circumstances, right? So it's not any particular policy, uh, this passive approach. Right? The end result and the type of policy may be completely differently designed. Nevertheless, you see the government non-reacting and you say government is passive. Right? This is one of the reasons why Hayek hated the term laissez-faire, right? because he was against the term laissez-faire, because he said laissez-faire basically means non-doing something, but non-doing something doesn't mean it's something good, right? something uh, beneficial or something desirable. Now, that deflation... Uh, generally is the process of deleveraging de of financial institutions. And the main question I will try to address is uh, in this uh, presentation is do Austrians need to be extreme liquidationists? Right? So meaning do Austrians need to favor a policy of non-reacting no matter what the circumstances are? Right? So whenever you see a crisis happening and uh, banks falling or many institutions falling, under the existing setup, the Austrians need to always cheer up for that. I right? always say, hey, bankruptcy is cool, right? That's, that's the, the skull you see there. So we're always clapping and being very, very happy that they are going down. Let's open the champagne, right? Let's have fun. Uh, now, uh, I will start with the difference between Austrian science and, and Austrian pop. Right? So Austrian science is uh, especially macroeconomic science, is the theory of the business cycle. Right? So macroeconomic description of cycle movements caused by various factors, usually caused by credit expansion with artificially low interest rates. Right? So you know the story of, of ABCT, as it is called. It's a theory of boom bust. Boom is caused by low interest rate, credit expansion, mall investments are caused by that. And then uh, the end result, at some point, you have a bust. So bust is actually not something external, exogenous, uh, meaning that it comes from uh, uh, internal market forces. It is something caused previously by mall investments and bad monetary policy or bad uh, banking decisions, depending on which version, which version of the ABCT you prefer. So there is a causal relationship between the boom and the bust. That's the Austrian science, explanation of the relationship, right? Causal realist explanation. Now, there, apart from Austrian science, you have Austrian pop, right? Austrian pop. And Austrian pop is, uh, is ba uh, Austrian pop is the name I use for uh, popular writings, popular Austrian writings, where you have slightly different description. And, and very often when you hear about Austrian explanations, especially when you hear lectures of uh, financial anal analysts, you hear mostly that Austrian pop songs, right? So what is Austrian pop song? It's almost a uh, biblical assertion that bust is a punishment for the boom, right? So these guys are going down because they deserve it. So again, let's open the champagne, right? So that, that would be the Austrian pop version. Uh, so, BAST is supposed to clean, this, clean out the system, and then even sometimes you hear this uh, expression that it is merely redistributive, right? So it's just pure redistribution. So it's almost like a zero-sum game. You have winners, 
and you have losers. And somehow, even though most economists, and especially Austrian economists, don't believe in welfare measurements, right? You cannot really say that welfare stays the same. Generally, you could hear that it's only a question of redistribution. So net effect could be uh, seen as a zero-sum game, right? Meaning that somebody wins, somebody loses, but averaging think, things out somehow, well, it's no different than the uh, usual workings of the financial system. When somebody sells the stock and somebody buys it, so usually somebody wins, somebody loses, but the net effect is, is just a zero-sum game. Right, but this Austrian pop, very often heard, right, is, uh, is based on this assertion that um, uh, liquidationism, right, so the bank or, or many institutions going down, it's a natural consequence of the boom, and actually it's cleaning out the system, right, so it's, it's, it's supposed to happen, like no matter what, the, no matter how the cleaning works, right, because again, the so-called passive government policy means the government is not doing anything. But under different institutional arrangements, it can mean completely separate things, right? Not doing anything. Not doing anything, sorry. <clears throat> Here we come to a uh, distinction that is present in the Austrian science, right? in the writings of Austrian economists, this distinction between recession and secondary depression. So what's the distinction? Well, roughly, sometimes it's really hard to make this distinction, but roughly, it is a... Um, <clears throat> Difference between liquidation of mall investments caused by artificially low interest rates and falling money supply. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is uh, that falling money supply usually hurts almost every single business, apart from businesses which are betting against the, uh, the, the banking system or against the financial markets, right? So very narrow. You always have uh, winners, even during Great Depression you had businesses that earned a lot of money. Nevertheless, the falling money supply or the uh, adjustment process associated with falling money supply actually was hurting uh, not only uh, the main industries that benefited from, arti from artificially low interest rate during the boom, but also most of other businesses that were not connected at all to the system, to the financial system, or were not actually benefiting from those low interest rates, right? Now, uh, naturally, the, <clears throat> the border uh, line between the two, it's blurred in reality very often, right? So, so sometimes uh, it's really hard to make the difference, right? Or point, oh, this is the business that benefited from artificially low interest rates, and this is the business that didn't benefit at all, and it's hurt by the, uh, by the falling banking system. So I, we cannot really make this distinction fully, as usually it is the case in economics. Nevertheless, uh, 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 qualitatively, we can grasp the difference, right? At least the degree of the difference. There is a degree. Uh, <clears throat> there is there is some. Uh, there are some small steps that you could see between the two, between liquidation of mall investment and then falling banking system or falling money supply that hurts everyone basically, right? And that would be the distinction between recession, usual cleaning out of the system where you get rid of wrong investments. And going further than that, right? So uh, allowing uh, for the whole system to collapse and then this thing hurting uh, all the other businesses that were not, that did not benefit directly from low interest rates. So overall, uh, this could be seen as, uh, as a mirror of the difference between the fiat money regime and gold exchange standard. Right? So you will see, uh, when you will see uh, the history of uh, the United States, you will see that the worst in terms of, um, in terms of um, performance, economic performance, assuming, analyzing, sorry, uh, the unemployment rate, uh, falling banks, and, and, and GDP fluctuations, and overall economic growth, you will see that actually fiat money regime looks a bit better than gold exchange standard. Well, that there might be different uh, explanations for that. I don't want to go into that because then we would have to have another lecture. Nevertheless, I believe that it has a lot to do with this distinction between just pure liquidation of mall investment and then the whole banking system falling and going down the tube with everything else, right? So taking all the businesses with it, <clears throat> since money is the life of the economy. Now, about this distinction between recession and secondary depression, or as it is called, secondary uh, deflation, I give to you three quotes from Austrian thinkers, important Austrian thinkers, so Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich von Hayek, and 
Rothbard, starting with Mises, who has written, deflation and credit contraction, no less than inflation and credit expansion, are elements disarranging the smooth course of economic activities. Right, so uh, he sees the inflation as the car hitting the pedestrian, right, and and then uh, the process of deflation, falling money supply, as putting on the reverse gear and trying to fix the problem by going backwards, right, over the pedestrian again. Right, so he's not really seeing the deflation of the money supply, falling money supply, as something fixing the thing. Right? Uh, of course, by deflation, he doesn't mean price deflation. Right? Price deflation is something else, actually. Price deflation, I'll leave uh, till the end of the, of the presentation. What he means by deflation is purely monetary approach to the money supply and credit created with uh, creation of the money supply. Right, so he was against that and he has seen it as a disruptive element, just as disruptive as inflationary policy, right? He even has written in human action that nobody favors such a policy, uh, deflationary policy of falling money supply, so I don't, I don't even need to deal with that, right? So he, he should have waited for Rothbard to show up, huh? and then uh, <coughs> telling him, no, no, I favor that. <laughs> Okay, uh, Hayek, of course, naturally, he was even more reserved. So, although I do not regard deflation as the original cause of a decline in business activity, such a reaction has unquestionably the tendency to induce the process of deflation, you know, typical Hayek, right, going on and on and on, to cause what more like Energizer commercial, could be like a bunny saying that, right? Um, to cause more, uh, to cause what more than 40 years ago I called secondary deflation. The effect of which may be worse in the 30s certainly was worse, and that was the original cause of the reaction made necessary. Okay, so in any case, what he means is that deflation happening after the process of the boom and falling money supply can actually lead to more serious damage than the initial boom. Right? <clears throat> Always, uh, this is the greatest case of that is Great Depression case. Right? It's really, you cannot explain the greatness of Great Depression by merely referring to the boom, right? You wouldn't say to a person unemployed in 1937 for like being unemployed for seven years, you wouldn't tell that person, now, this is because of the boom that happened, you know, 10 years ago, right? You, you couldn't say that, right? So there are uh, necessar ne uh, necessary, there are other factors uh, necessary to cause such a long, long depression, right? Not only the boom, the boom could be initially the problem, but then what was going on after that, after the recession was even more important. Uh, and everybody, of course, agrees with that. And, and according to Hayek, this is one of the this was one of the problems. So he would uh, certainly agree with Friedman's analysis of the Great Depression to some point that uh, uh, letting the money supply collapse was one of the factors to uh, that, that that caused additional problems. <clears throat> and then even Rothbard, right? So even Rothbard, even though if you read Rothbard, you will see that overall he was cheering for monetary deflation. At one point in, in Mystery of Banking, when he was talking about the uh, monetary reform, he actually has written something in the spirit of Hayek and Mises, where he said that we have to be, we have to make steps <clears throat> that will allow us insuring against of wrecking deflation. That would lead to a severe recession and numerous bankruptcies. For the logic of returning of 500 required deflation of money supply down to existing bank reserves. This would be a massive deflationary ringer indeed, one of the, and one wonders whether a policy equally sound and free market oriented, which can avoid such a virtual short-lived economic holocaust. Right? So he admits in here, indirectly, that actually falling money supply can be an economic holocaust. Right? So uh, in the spirit of Hayek and Mises, of course, in other works, most of the works, 80% of works, uh, he did not uh, he did not write such things, right? He was uh, cheering for monetary deflation more often, and uh, he was um, he was not the only one. Actually, I think there were economists in the 30s uh, that accepted monetary contraction, but not as something beneficial because Rothbard was making actually arguments that it's very beneficial because it stimulates, uh, because it speed up, speeds up the adjustment process because it stimulates uh, savings. Uh, but the, uh, the, uh, the, the other economists in the 30s, well, he, he, he was not the, the one in the 30s, of course, but the other economists arguing in favor actually were um, 
were arguing that this is something um, that we have to accept if you want to stay on the gold standard, right? So this is like a necessary price, gold exchange standard, of course, with the central bank. Uh, so this is a necessary price that we have to pay uh, to keep the system floating. <coughs> Okay, so um, now why did deflation? Um, there are various arguments against monetary contraction. Uh, I think the, the most interesting arguments uh, were made by Fisher, Irving Fisher, who is unfortunately famous for other things he's done, not for this one, uh, either for his <coughs> mathematical works. If you're interested, you could read his doctorate degree uh, about mathematical investigations into theory of value. Very, very interesting, uh, interesting literature. And, uh, of course, Fisher equation and his quantity theory of money. So anyway, he's famous for his works about the equilibrium theory. Right? So that's why he's famous. He's considered one of the best American economists ever. And then after he basically went bankrupt during Great Depression, he changed his mind almost about everything. And then he's not famous for the works he has written at that time. Well, um, at least he was not that famous until a few years ago when people uh, started uh, to be again interested in his works about the deflation theory. In general, again, I don't want to assess the theory, but I want to vindicate Fisher uh, for this because he was one of the first, um, first economists actually focusing on that, and he's better in explaining why the adjustment process during monetary deflation is, uh, is sluggish why it's really, why the process is sticky and why the process is rigid. Usually when you hear the arguments about monetary contraction, they are pure price are pricing arguments, meaning that prices are rigid, prices are not adjusting and so forth and so forth. Now Fisher makes different arguments. Uh, so what's the essence of uh, the deflation theory? Where well, first we have the phenomenon of over indebtedness, right? So if it increases in debt <coughs> during the boom, naturally, this over indebtedness, oh, Again, sorry, let's go back. You could ask, what is... Ah, uh, this is killing me. So, so what is over-indebtedness? Uh, Again, uh, subject to the debate, what does it mean that the, the, the institutions, the, uh, the firms are over-indebted? That's another issue to be discussed, but again, we're focusing generally. So over-indebtedness, which during the bust will end up in debt liquidation and just selling, right? Because if you're indebted, uh, then you have to pay your debts. During the crisis, you have to sell your assets, so you, you're engaged in distress sellings. Furthermore, this induces falling prices, falling net worth, business is going down, and then you have falling profits. And if you have falling profits, this is terrible, right? Because then if you have falling profits, you have falling output. The adjustment takes time, but then apart from that, you have additional consequences. You have hoarding, because you see businesses falling, you see some monetary deflation also happening. So you're hoarding money, so you're increasing your monetary demand. This uh, influences the interest rate usually because it's at the expense of, uh, of uh, the investment expenditures. <clears throat> and then when the interest rate rises, you have again the problem of over indebtedness visualizing, right? Because the, the firms cannot take even more debt, they have to pay their debts and they have to sell their assets, therefore you have this vicious circle, right? Again, you have debt liquidation or distress selling, assets going down and so on, right? Like a vicious, vicious cycle. Um, which interestingly led Fisher to uh, completely change his mind about economic policy. In the 20s, he favored a version of gold exchange standard, something like that, with the central bank trying to hit the the right price of the gold to keep the system stable, to keep the price level stable, right? So he was very happy about the policy in the 20s. And even in 29, he said, now, oh, the stocks are going up and will always go up, basically. Right, so we're, have, we're having a really, really good time now. But then the, the, the situation completely reversed and we had a serious, serious Great Depression, the, the biggest contraction in the history of, uh, of the capitalist system. And then Fisher changed his, changed his mind. Right, so he started to looking for the problems of order, over the indebtedness and, uh, and financial booms. And he found the victim. The victim was fractional reserve banking. And uh, in, uh, in his publication in the 30s, he proposed a system of 100% fiat standard, right? 100% uh, dollar standard. Because uh, uh, on, the, on, one side, on the one side, he wanted to still have active monetary policy to keep up 
the price level stable, right? So you need monetary expansion, right? But on the other hand, you have this evil fractional reserve banking system that allows to create over indebtedness, right? Because the main problem uh, associated with monetary expansion within the banking system is that the banks are creating money, but no, they're not giving it away, right? They create it and they create immediately also the uh, the creditor relation, creditor debtor relation, right? Because they create money and they lend it to someone. Right, so this creates the phenomenon of over indebtedness because this pushes out uh, the natural capital accumulation that you have in the capitalist system through just equity and uh, and savings without the creation of money. Right, so savings uh, in terms of equity and investment spending they are very very stable. Right, it just depends on people's preferences to save. But in the banking sector, this is not so uh, this is not so obvious. The financial intermediation is a bit more fragile, right? So we have creation of new money, and then this new money pushes out, crowds out the uh, the typical capital accumulation with equity funding, right? So therefore, the best way is just to get rid of this uh, thing that creates the phenomenon of over indebtedness, and then creates the problem of potential problem of debt of deflation, monetary deflation itself, right? So if you get rid of fractional reserves. Then you will get rid of the problem of possible over indebtedness, and then you, the, the system will be more stable, meaning that any fluctuations uh, will not be um, will not be associated with monetary contraction, right? Because if you have 100% fiat standard, money is completely covered, banks cannot really go down, and the central bank can perform a happy monetary policy of printing money. Via Friedman rule, right? So five percent or two percent or three percent—I don't know which one. Right? It's supposed to be a simple program, but anyway, uh, create additional amounts of money each year to bid up the price level. So uh, I'm not assessing the uh, <clears throat> the theory right now. Uh, I think it needs a serious correction and serious developments and so on. I don't want to make my statements about this because then you will attack me, and I, I don't want that. Uh, but again, I want to vindicate Fisher to show that he was one of the first to deal with it, with the problem of monetary contraction. And, and what I really like about his arguments is that he's not really focus, focusing directly on price rigidity or price deflation as a problem. Well, he does to some extent, but uh, as you will see, as you see in his arguments, it's not really deflation, price deflation itself that is the problem. And here is why I'm referring to this happy fellow, uh, William Harold Hutt who was writing about uh, significance of price adjustments. And you can actually make Fisher arguments reliable to some extent with uh, getting rid of, uh, of pointing to price deflation as a problem. And my argument is that, well, as, as most Austrian arguments are, that price deflation actually is not a problem. It is never a problem. Actually, no price can be a problem at all. Prices are your friends. Always, right? Because price is just a uh, amount of property that you can receive for getting rid of your property. So this is something that allows you to change in your uh, environment, in your financial environment, in your personal environment, right? Whatever you do, whether you go to the restaurant and you see high prices, right? I, ha I had a friend like that, right? You go, you could go to the restaurant with him. He's reading the prices in the menu. I would complain, oh, these prices are high, and he's like, shut up and eat or get out. Things are just price, so you just enjoy them and don't complain, right? A pretty rough way to a pretty rough way to analyze reality, but in any case, there is some point in it, right? So all the things are just priced, so just accept the price or just just refuse to engage in any exchange, and this is always true, whether it's high inflation or high price deflation. Price deflation is always a good thing whenever it's happening, because if it's happening, it means it has to happen, right? So what I mean by this is that uh, price flexibility during both inflation and deflation is a good thing. So paradoxically, price inflation and price deflation are always optimal, right? Which is against intuition, you could think, right? But then uh, let's analyze the case of high, high inflation, right? So you're thinking we have 20% increases in prices, at the stores, you could complain, ah, those prices are increasing by 20%, right? This is something uncomfortable. No, actually, the fact that they increase by 20% still allows you to buy stuff, because otherwise, if the price did not go up, you would have a shortage, so you, could, you wouldn't be able to buy it. 
Uh, the real problem is what caused the price inflation in its, uh, initially, and usually this is printing of money by the government. Right? So when you when you were living in in the era of high inflation, the uh, the high inflation was actually a solution to the problem of creation of money in the in the first place. Right? So so similarly, when you see price deflation during the crisis. Uh, price deflation is usually a solution to the problem, right? It's not the initial problem itself. It just helps you solve the problem. And this is uh, actually in, 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 in works even of some uh, Austrian economists, you could read that prices adjustment are problematic, right? But it's actually the argument, even if you agree that the, the problems in which you have prices adjustments are serious, actually you should change the, the argument, right? You shouldn't say that there's something wrong with the prices, Maybe there's something wrong with cause the prices to go down, but the, f the falling down itself is actually a solution to the problem, right? So the big issue is always what prices are adjusting to, right? Because they are always adjusting to uh, some conditions um, that, that, that have to be addressed, right? Some problems have to be addressed. So X can be a problem, but prices reacting to X never can be a problem. Right, so the way they react, they, the, the way they react, they are supposed to react. So when they are rigid, as Jacob was saying yesterday during his lecture, when they are rigid, well, apparently there is some optimal stickiness of prices associated with the market dynamics. Right, uh, the completely flexible prices would actually be a, a disaster. Right, so you need prices to be sticky to some extent, and falling prices themselves, they, they will allow you to solve the problem. Right, so think about going bankrupt, right? You're going bankrupt, you have to sell your flat or you have to sell your assets quickly and you have to lower the prices. So you could complain, oh, the prices are low, I have to sell my real estate right now. Well, you could complain, but actually the fact that they go down, the prices go down, allows you to sell it in the first place, right? So it's not really a falling price that is the problem for you. The problem was initial uh, bankruptcy or, or financial trouble that you got into in the first place. Now the uh, answers, so do Austrians need to be extremely liquidationist? Well, not really. The, the main thing in the Austrian uh, analysis is the significance of price adjustment and the importance of price adjustments under various conditions. ABCT does not imply liquidationism, it merely and here's the summary. So it demonstrates the effects of credit expansion, monetary contraction, and of course, selective bailouts. Now, um, I am not, well, the presentation is a bit um, cut into pieces, right? So I am not making any particular statements. Uh, this is treated as a, uh, as a Hegelian bite. right? to think about the problem, right? I am not making any case in favor of uh, um, of avoiding monetary contraction, or I'm not making the case for, for particular avoidance of monetary contraction. I am merely showing to you that uh, pure liquidationism is actually not a uh, is not part of 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 the core of the Austrian science. Right? This is not part of it. You could make some cases in favor of liquidationism, definitely, but this is not something inherently associated with Austrian science. Right? Okay, so that was a bit quick, quicker than I expected. Probably I was telling it too fast, but happily we can now fight. So uh, comments and questions, we have, I think, 20 minutes. So. so I have a question. Sure. Than, uh, sorry. No, 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 we can go first and then we know. Because okay. you kind of implying that all of the, my investments are occurring in the real economy, right? But if you've got like 2008 and if you have Lehman Brothers or AIG and they've all got the derivatives, we can still call them my investments. And in the face of what you just said, we shouldn't let them go back at it because that would be liquidation in the financial sector, right? So can you really put a border that this is my investment that we should keep and this is the one that should go bankrupt? Okay. Mm -hmm. so, does this theory that we should well, fear of liquidation is work work hundred percent of the time? So, or in other way, would, would you rescue the brothers if you could? No, no, I was actually cheering for them going down. No, no, no. So, I was opening the champagne too, but. Uh, uh, 
It's a very, very valid point, right? The, the, the banking sector also can have investments, and then you could consider them all investments. So where do you draw the line? Well, uh, it's really hard to draw a line because it would be easier to draw the line if you had a precise definition of money supply, I guess. So it would be easy to draw the line before the 70s. And right now, where you have a mixture of deposit banking and investment banking, you could draw some lines that will easily allow you to classify the Lehman case as just more investments, right? Uh, but then, since uh, I myself believe that this uh, precise definition of money supply is not, um, is not easy to be given, I don't believe you can strictly just say this is money supply and this is not some money supply, mostly because of the reason because under the current circumstances, this is uh, any distinction that you will draw will not be important in the um, condition of the central banking system, of the central bank. Right? The central bank is the most important factor in here, just like fractional reserves. I don't believe fractional reserves today are important at all because you have the central bank. This is the most important thing. Uh, um, influencing the the, the the market. So going back, because we have because we have the central bank, then we cannot really make a separate, clear distinction between money supply and the rest. Therefore, we cannot easily give the answer to the problem that you. I believe you cannot easily give the answer to the problem that you posed. So uh, I would have to say I rest my case. But anyway, I would cheer for lemon going down, and that would be horrible if it was saved. I think so. Sorry, I cannot answer that. Yeah. Well, my question is about the price rigidities and monetary policy. Um, if we cannot and we, if we shouldn't get rid of the price rigidities because of microeconomic reasons, what is your preferable monetary policy and what do you think about the policy of targeting nominal GDP uh, a la market monetarism and Scott Summer? <laughs> because if we cannot, if we cannot find money, uh, shouldn't we focus on money times its velocity, that is, nominal income? Do we have time for another lecture? <laughs> I still have some time. <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't like the policy of targeting nominal GDP for various reasons. Mainly because GDP is a bad index, right? Okay, okay. Let's, let's say not GDP, mm -hmm. but nominal income, however defined, mm -hmm. in, in, in broad, broad way. Well, again, uh, I like the microeconomic approach. So whenever you see prices adjusting to any conditions, never argue about the prices as the problem because it's macroeconomic reasoning that I dislike. What you should address is the question, so this thing that causes prices to decline in the first place, should we engage in monetary policy to stop those effects working, right? So this would be less Sumnerian and less Horwitzian argument, but more Whiteian argument, right? Meaning that, so it's not the question whether we should uh, stop prices for falling, it's the question, should we increase the money supply through fractional reserves because there is increased monetary demand? So should we economize on the increased monetary demand? And this would be a valid question, which I like much more than just targeting some Right. Yeah, but if, if we cannot get rid of a, a, of a uh, central, central bank, bank what, what would be that, this policy? Because we probably cannot also get away with fractional reserve banking, and I don't believe we should. But if this is the case, what should the central bank do right now? Mm, it's like asking the question in, in socialism, what prices should be set by the central planner? Right? No, no, I, I believe so, because even if you target nominally, I believe, okay, if you target GDP to, or nominal income to stay stable, I believe you can still have financial bubbles with the central bank. But you will not have that, uh, that deflation on that scale, because the, the money supply times its velocity will not collapse. Because every time it moves, the central bank would go, uh, would, would act and increase the money supply to stable. <laughs> But I believe this would happen only if you have Fisherian plan with 100% reserves, because otherwise you cannot completely control what is going on. Well, if you if you suggest that there is a liquidity trap problem, then yes, but I don't think this this is true. So this is just a uh, Dave, Nikolai was first. Uh, okay, so uh, you gave uh, I believe uh, two positive views of Fisherian theory as. Uh, 
different from uh, arguments about inflation that uh, do not rely on uh, that rely exclusively on price changes. So I wonder to what extent the Fisherian view is not also based on price rigidities. If you look at one of the causal relations there, uh, so in this theory, falling prices would imply falling profits. Mm -hmm. But to me, it looks like this implies price rigidities. If uh, uh, prices, uh, so again, profits are just price differences, and what matters is not the profit in nominal amount, but the return of uh, uh, the investment. Uh, the cost spent. So you might very well, in a depressionary environment, have a significant improvement in net return of investments, so that economic activity starts again, and you do not have a debt repayment problem. Of course, you would have to adjust the nominal amount of the initial debt contract to the new value of uh, the, the assets, huh? otherwise you would never pay the nominal amount. So it requires some uh, contract adjustment of uh, the nominal amount of the debt. But I don't think that you have the vicious circle. And the, you, this vicious circle, I have the feeling, somehow implies rigid prices. Mm -hmm. well, what would you think about this? Isn't it, um, can it be explained as the difference between priced as ex real prices as expressed as prices actually allowing for exchange and price offers? Would that explain the difference? Uh, so in a way, uh, the, uh, the real prices... No, actually I messed it up, sorry. Yeah, 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 meaning that, you know, the price offers are, uh, well, the spending has to stay similar, right? I mean, yeah, so meaning that prices actually could go down, but the exchanges are not realized because there is some lag going on, right? Can you make such an argument that prices actually adjust, but then the transactions are much lower, right? And uh, the selling of assets is still driving the process, whereas uh, the expansion of of uh, of business activity is actually being lowered. So you get rid of assets and you're focusing on paying the capital off more often, right? So you're devoting more capital uh, to get rid of the debt rather than to finance the assets, right? So this would be more like Richard Kuh's arguments about financial balance sheet recession, right? This way, probably, right? So Kuh could, can actually be considered as, as a guy who expanded Fisher's analysis and and, and even more went away a bit from this price rigidity thing. But yeah, I, I would agree that in Fisher's arguments, the price rigidities are, yeah, I'm done playing them, but he was emphasizing them more, you're right. Uh, Michal, later, but first day? Uh, yeah, actually, it's a related one on that uh, with Fisher, because this is always a problem that I had with him, even though I'm really sympathetic, sympathetic to this debt deflation argument. Uh, the assumption that falling prices has to generally reduce profits. And you could have a situation where both input and output prices are falling down at the exact same rate, so your price spread is the same, but you don't get general reduction in profits, you just get uh, increased profits on goods that are demand elastic and decreased profits on those that are demanded elastic. So I, I don't think his, his debt deflationism is a specific example and the specificity would have to be that your demand elasticities would have to be identical on everything. Um, anyway, that's just a... So the right side of the circle is interesting and the left side is just... throw it out. Yeah, I think it... Well, it could have some appeal, but I don't think that that bottom link that we've got between falling prices... Is Here, this is, this is the crucial, yeah. yeah, yeah I it's, a, that. it's a tenuous link, maybe. Um, right. But the, the comment I wanted to, to make was, I like at the beginning how you say... Uh, you know, the obvious question of the Great Depression is what made it so great? And that's one that Austrian business cycle theory is not in a good position, at least traditionally stated is not in a good position to answer. And you want to answer it by saying it's because of the secondary recession caused by debt deflation. I, I think that's your, mm -hmm. your point to this. But then, um, just as you could say to somebody in 1937, hey buddy, you lost your job because of uh, something that happened in 1929, and that doesn't make sense. Today, we have not had debt deflation over the last five years, but you're pretty hard pressed to say, hey buddy, you still don't have a job because something that happened six years ago. And we don't have debt deflation. So I don't think this is a, 
It could potentially be an explanation, but I don't think it's a general. There's other factors. That obviously, there's other factors at play. Yeah, you're right. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I have another comment. Um, I'm not sure if the debt inflation theory is not a an example of a price rigidity. Overall, a debt repayment is, uh, you know, a repayment that is also fixed in nominal, uh, nominal terms. So there is this article um, in Cato, uh, sorry, on Econ Law called "Debt: The Stickiest Price of All," and I do believe very strongly that this is the case with the uh, debt repayments that they are they are set nominally. Mm -hmm. So the solution to this, of course, other than the a nominal income policy by the central bank would be to um, to in all debt contracts to make this clause about the nominal GDP and so if the nominal GDP would fall the debt repayment would also fall and if it would rise it would also rise so in this way you could limit that the uh, um, the effect of for, of changing uh, nominal GDP on debt repayments, but unfortunately, this is this I think is a very costly, um, costly way to do to do this. But I, I guess that if uh, we cannot change the monetary policy of a central bank, this would be the way to solve the debt inflation problem. Yeah, but uh, but not under. But so you but you can sign a private contract saying that, right? That's true, and some governments issue uh, such uh, bonds. But uh, the problem is that uh, uh, this debt inflation does not apply only to, uh, to governments, it also applies to private individuals. And since I'm not sure if they really understand the, uh, the uh, causation between uh, falling nominal income and their ability to repay debts, this is why they do not include such clauses in, in the contract. So if it could be uh, done on a wide scale, I guess it would be one of the possible solutions to the debt deflation uh, scare. Mm -hmm. But referring to the first thing you said, yeah, it can be considered uh, debt as a, the most rigid price. Yeah, but then this is, uh, yeah, it makes sense, but this is something really different than uh, the usual argument of price rigidities related to labor markets, right? To price rigidities understood as current price offers that are formed based on past expectations, right? Because that's the usual uh, rigidity, uh, rigidity argument, maybe apart from New Keynesian literature. But, uh, but right, right. But then the usual uh, argument about prices not adjusting is the fact that they, you have those evil unions and, 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 uh, and all the people used to higher wages, so they are not allowing new contracts to be lower, right? But but the past, the bygones staying on, on our backs is uh, can be considered a uh, price rigidity, although I would say it's something else, right? This is, it's, it's not really a price anymore because it was just realized, right? But Dave, you wanted to jump yeah, in? Yeah, I don't actually buy the argument that the price of debt is the most rigid price because restructuring is pretty common. Oh. During a boom, I mean, and restructurings are a nice way to change the the price of debt rather than a general inflation because a general inflation just saves everybody while the problem is not that let's say all prices are too high or all prices are too low on the eve of the bus the problem is some are too high and some are too low and restructurings allow us to get rid of the ones which are wrong and reset the ones which still have a hope in hell of success well to me the problem is which solution is faster which solution is less costly i guess it's Renegotiating, renegotiating all debt contracts is extremely possible because you also have this who goes first problem from the you know, monetary equilibrium theory. So, in order to renegotiate your debts, uh, the other guys also should have renegotiated uh, their debts because if they renegotiate uh, the debt with you and uh, they still have to pay the high debt uh, to someone else. It's a problem. So in a banking sector which is interconnected, I guess that it's, it's, not, it's not that easy, but sure, it's one of the solutions. But I think uncertainty added on that, right? Be, uh, policy uncertainty, 
Because usually when we see this who, those, who goes first, it's usually not because there is a problem with renegotiation. Usually it's a problem because we don't know what will happen with monetary policy in an uncertain era, right? That's, the, that's why market monitors uh, propose that nominal income rule, so that a monetary policy is not affected by, by <coughs> uh, The nominal income, this would be the last thing I'll say about it, actually. The nominal income rule isn't a, isn't a solution, though, because it's a solution to the wrong problem. It's a solution assuming that the that all prices are wrong. So we're going to readjust all prices by affecting the general price level, but it's not its not a problem of all prices being wrong, it's just that some are too high, some are too low. So restructuring, even if it is costly, and I actually don't think that it is that costly, no more than writing the initial contracts anyway, take out the debt, allows you to realign all those prices. I guess I'd like to have a comment uh, on this quotes <laughs> from Mises and Rothbard, because I think uh, when they say bad things about deflation, they mean another thing. When you read Mises, when he says that deflation, then deflation is a like he, he writes about government policy, and he gives example of what he means by this bad deflation. It's Great Britain after the Polonian Wars, and Great Britain mm -hmm. after World War One, when mm -hmm. the government uh, uh, conducted a policy uh, of uh, imposing deflation uh, on the market, when not deflation was Say a uh, market fund like when you have a bank run in a banking that uh, Mrs. advocated, and when human action can find a very positive statement about so called secondary inflation, uh, he says the, the, the entrepreneur during the crisis uh, lose faith in their abilities because they scrap so badly uh, in the boom, so they need big price differentials, so the faster the inflation goes. Uh, the faster entrepreneurs go back to the market and invest again. And Oldbart, I think, also is in the concept of monetary reform. You do not impose deflation on people. Forced deflation uh, is bad, but not necessarily it's a market deflation. Uh, yeah, I didn't know that. And uh, about debt deflation, or possibly explaining the, the, the length of uh, America's Great Depression, uh, I think that it should be. Yeah. That was not a big problem uh, between 1929 and 1952. Some banks failed, but there were mostly small rural banks that uh, invested heavily uh, in agricultural. It was a big agricultural bubble starting from World War I and uh, propped up by government in the 1920s. So the, the major banks uh, were liquid. They did not have problems, and only then Roosevelt actually imposed bank holidays on banks. And banks uh, the enough for it. So um, I think there, there was not a big banking crisis, there was a debt crisis in America. So mm -hmm. I don't see it's how it ends. Right? Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't make that historic, uh, historical case. Uh, general uh, atmosphere. Okay, no, yeah. I didn't say that uh, that's a great case of debt deflation theory, the, the Great Depression. I wouldn't say that. But you're actually addressing Fisher more, right? Do you think that we have uh, now, uh, during the current uh, economic crisis, uh, such threat of secondary depression in the uh, Eurozone? Uh, it depends where. In Germany, probably not. Right. Uh, meaning that uh, some time ago you could make the case uh, for Italy, Greece, and Spain having secondary uh, depression. Has uh, already started? No, but the, 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 the deposit base was flowing out from those countries to uh, to Germany. So in Germany you you wouldn't have it, but then in those countries you, you would have it. Meaning that you have a movement of uh, of uh, the deposit base from one country to the other. So the country that received deposits did not experience this secondary contraction, but uh, the other country that experienced it actually this this outflow they had additional, the secondary effect, right? Because the, the initial problem was the debt uh, problem of the government, right? The public debt. And then since you have all the interconnections between the debts and the banking system, the deposits were flowing out of the country. So that would be the secondary effect for those countries, but not for those countries. So you cannot, so you cannot make the case for the whole Euro area. It's, it's not clear for me, uh, is, it, uh, is, it, is it already, started or you see uh, this um, 
secondary depression in, in that country. For the whole... But for the whole Eurozone, no, no, generally, or for those countries? I don't know, Mateo can answer. He's uh, know the actual. I think that uh, alcohol deposit, I think, kind of like uh, in late 2012, and targeting balances are shrinking. But we still have, for example, uh, negative CPI in Greece. Uh, so there is uh, actual inflation there. Not price deflation. Yes, yes, yes. Surely not because the productivity increased so much. <laughs> there is more like, feta cheese produced and less fused cheese. I'm sure for this question. Is Cyprus on the verge of a secondary depression? Possibly, well... I don't know, I didn't study their cases, so I don't want to make ex cathedra statements. So, Nikolai, maybe you have... some... <laughs> Some thoughts you could share? No, for the Cypriot case, most of the deposits which were dealt in were non-resident deposits, so I'm not sure that the impact on the monetary supply within the country has been so important. Uh, then uh, the argument which is being brought today, I, I have the feeling, is not very much about the inflation, but about the leveraging of the banking sector, by which uh, the commentators mean that there is a kind of creditless uh, growth. And everybody doubts that this is possible. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, business is so much accustomed to debt relations and to being refunded by the commercial banks that uh, without this, uh, you do not get uh, indeed uh, restarting of the production processes. But at the same time, uh, the economy. Uh, I mean, Cyprus is a difficult case because they have moved uh, to a cash based economy because of deposit restrictions. And because of that, uh, the official data frost is not much relevant for total economic transactions. So it's difficult to say. But probably what they mean by the deflation nowadays is uh, this double tick recession, which was mentioned uh, in respect to some countries in this administration. Dave, and just as an interesting thought experiment, you should consider that in Europe today, maybe there's a secondary inflation going on in Germany, a debt inflation with all the deposits flowing into the country. Oh, right, right. An opposite case, right? That makes sense, right. Even the interest rates at some point were negative, right? Nominal interest rates were negative on German debt. Yeah, I mean, and also in counterfactual terms, I mean, thanks to David for mentioning inflation. I mean, in counterfactual terms, uh, all the actions that the European system of central banks and uh, IMF and ESM sponsored bailouts have done was actually to keep the money supply from falling, even in the periphery. So, in a sense, we are witnessing counterfactually inflation, even. The to fight monetary contraction. Exactly. exactly. I have one more question about this Fisheria model. Mm -hmm. uh, why is uh, falling profits necessarily because falling output? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, because pr profits are the main reasons to expand output. Right, to invest money, to invest in, in increases in output. Why would you increase output without, if you... Would you have a market profits falling and you want to get more, earn more, so maybe you should invest in output to get more... Oh yeah, to, to, yeah but, but salary is paribus, right? If, if, if you have like given technology and, and given economics of scales and everything and all you have just price difference, if the price difference is negative, you abstain from investing, it's better to keep the money hoarded rather than uh, than invested, yeah. Assuming, of course, that, well, if you, if you could spend more money to advertise and increase sales and so on, then, then sure. But assuming that you have everything else ceteris paribusized, then, uh, then uh, falling profits actually induce, well, uh, destroy the basic incentive to, to invest, right? And the last, last, this is just a quick comment for and assuming the money earns no interest or at least no negative interest. Right, but then if, yeah. Or you, you suspect the inflation will go up. Right, 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 right. But, but then if there is positive interest, it means that actually there are somewhere 
profits that have to be present somewhere, right? Because interest rate is positive because there is something on which you could earn the money, right? Okay. Thank you.